Okay, so thank you very much for being here with us today, Wang Shiwei. For our guests, Wang Shiwei is a doctoral candidate at Princeton University in the History Department. One thing that is very unique about him when compared with some of his other colleagues is that he actually spent three years in Iran's notorious Evin prison. When I first reached out to him, the response that I got was that he has always held Israel in very high regard, but that he had never imagined that his first association with Israel would be being accused of uh, being a Mossad spy by the Iranian regime. Can you elaborate a little bit on the story behind your imprisonment in Iran? Uh, yes. Um, so thank you. Uh, first, first of all, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me. Uh, and um, uh, as I said uh, in our initial um, uh, correspondence, that uh, I, I uh, always uh, held high regards of Israel. Uh, it's a small country uh, in a difficult geography, um, surrounded by uh, hostile uh, states. Um, but it not only managed to survive, uh, it thrived. Um, and then look at Israel today. Um, many people want to go there and live there. And then look at Iran today, um, an amazing country, uh, literally ruined by the regime and people are suffering. Um, and um, um, just to be sure, um, I love the Persian language. Uh, I have studied the um, Persian language um, for quite a few years um, on and off before I went to Iran. Um, I also love the Iranian culture. It's, it's got a deep civilization, um, but I didn't really expect what, uh, uh, what would happen uh, to me uh, when I actually uh, went there as a scholar to do my research, which has nothing to do with politics. Um, uh, and I didn't uh, write anything or say, uh, say, uh, say anything against the regime. Uh, I was purely a academic, but then they arrested me uh, while well, I was doing uh, dissertation research and um, they, uh, the Iranian intelligence, uh, the Ministry of Intelligence, and then they essentially, in the course of um, uh, interrogation, uh, told me that uh, they, they need me to be a spy uh, so that they can do a deal with the United States. Uh, without me being a spy, they, they can't do a deal. So I have to stay in prison until I confess to being a spy. So, so I basically had to confess, right? Because there's, there's no way out. And then I was not betraying anybody but myself for, uh, by confessing to things I have not done. Um, but uh, uh, to my surprise, uh, in, the court, uh, in the court session that, that convicted me, uh, they made uh, some nebulous connection uh, between me and Israel. They said, well, you're a you're Princeton student, um, and then the, you're, you're the, uh, the, the center, the Iranian Studies Center, um, uh, at Princeton that funded your research in Iran is um, funded by Baha'is. And then uh, the Baha'is have a temple in Israel and then these people are very close to Israel. Therefore, you are Israeli agent in addition to being American agent. Um, you, you may think this is like a joke and I can tell you there are many moments like that uh, in the court session uh, that you would not believe that this is a court session that this is something that can, can happen in a court session. Um, today, I'm telling you this with this big smile on my face and um, uh, uh, telling you about it like a joke, but it was not a joke. It was very, it, it's done serious um, uh, to, uh, uh, for me and for anybody in my situation where the regime didn't really care um, what we have done or have not done. What really mattered is to uh, use us as a pawn to convict us, uh, to to hold us as hostage uh, uh, through the the Iranian judiciary. Um, that's what they do, and then eventually, um, I after 40 months, uh, 40, 40 months of uh, uh, detainment, uh, I was eventually uh, able to return to the United States through a prisoner swap. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about? some of the interesting characters you encountered during your detainment and what you learned about them from Iranian society and the Iranian regime? So I was um, with uh, 
uh, Iranian people, uh, obviously men, um, of uh, all walks of life. Um, I was with um, um, uh, accused fundamental, a Sunni ex a fundamentalist, uh, and uh, I was with uh, financial uh, uh, people who have done financial fraud. Um, and I was with uh, Iranian um, ex-officials and diplomats and um, uh, even um, uh, people who circumvented a sanction uh, for Iran uh, and then uh, uh, money launderers um, uh, for the IRGC and then uh, members of uh, the negotiation team for JCPOA, uh, normal, uh, uh, ordinary businessmen, intellectuals, I can give you some examples. Um, you know, one of the early days when I was there, I, I was I was with this um, uh, Iranian uh, person. He he was uh, probably in his fifties, early fifties, and then uh, um, the, 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 this person was very very interesting. He was um, uh, uh, he had a lot of international experience. Uh, he was um, he was a cook in Tai a chef uh, in an Iranian restaurant in Taiwan for for a couple of years. He spent uh, five years right after the war, uh, Iran-Iraqi war, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe. He he tried to he tried to get to Western Europe, but never succeeded. Um, uh, but eventually, having spent several years in Eastern Europe, he returned to Iran, worked as a chef from time to time. He told me he lost his jobs all the time because of the instability of the uh, of the economy. Mm -hmm. um, the the and then and then the, the reason why he was in prison was that um, there was uh, there was a con man uh, who went around uh, to uh, to swindle people uh, as an agent of the Ministry of Intelligence, and then the, that con man um, hired him um, as a, as a minion, uh, if you will, to collect money for him. Um, and then so I. And then apparently this is a smart guy that who was in front of me. So I asked him, you, you didn't know this was a con man? He was uh, swindle money around that. He said, of course I know, right? He said, of course, but I lost my job. So, so I need to make my own, uh, he, he said, I need to make my ends meet. So what, what I'm gonna do? I don't even want to know. So he never told me and never asked. I pretend I didn't know, right? Um, uh, because because just the sheer sheer livelihood, I I, I need money to to pay um, uh, uh, to pay for things. Um, I have a, I have a wife and child and etc. I think that's a deeply tragic, if you if you will, um, look at the situation of Iran. The the the, the, the lower middle class are in such um, an unstable situation because of the general political condition. And then people often say, you know, um, the United States is morally liable uh, for sanctioning the Iranian, uh, 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 applying the sanction uh, against uh, Iran um, and um, uh, literally starving Iranian people. Um, but what really struck me uh, when I was there is through this kind of experience and the intercourse with the Iranians, and then they know, they told me we're under sanction because, because the regime, because the regime brought sanction upon us. Um, they understood, my, to my surprise, actually, I, I, I always avoided talking about the sanction, uh, you know, this kind of uh, Iran America politics, because that's a uh, uh, I, 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 I was often afraid that the, um, it's something that can be sensitive, but the Iranians around me uh, uh, left talking about these kind of things. And then they blamed the regime for, um, uh, for, for, bringing, uh, for bringing about US sanctioned international isolation upon them. And then very often they told me, um, uh, this man included, uh, that we'd rather endure sanctions uh, so the regime couldn't do more bad um, than uh, without sanctions and they depress, uh, 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 so they oppress us more. Oh, wow. so that, 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 was, that was really eye-opening, right? So um, another person I was with, um, very interesting, he, he was um, 
a, a money launderer for the IRGC. He, he was there because uh, the, the IRGC um, didn't like JCPOA. So they arrested people on the pro JCPOA camp. Uh, and then the Ministry of Intelligence arrested this guy. Um, you know, when you do money laundering, uh, obviously you're not clean and then you have something uh, in their hand and then uh, they arrested this person uh, 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 as a kind of a, a, a counter tactic against the IAGC move. So there's a pretty messy internal uh, politics, even between rival factions of uh, the Iranian intelligence uh, branches. Um, so uh, this this particular person. Uh, uh, what was was uh, he, he was secretive in many ways. He, he wouldn't tell me what he has done um, per se, but from time to time he will uh, shed uh, light on certain things. Um, we had a conversation, for example, about uh, the JCPOA, uh, U.S. leverage on Iran, and etc. So he basically told me um, the only effective leverage. Uh, that U.S. has uh, on Iran uh, was the financial sanction, uh, and then uh, if and then uh, if U.S. Uh, according to JCPOA, when that uh, uh, leverage is taken away, then Iran will not uh, talk about other issues because it, does, it, it because the regime doesn't have to, right? Um, and then, uh, and then, um, so well before the JCPOA, uh, uh, well before Trump uh, left the JCPOA, uh, he told me. Um, so I asked him, you know, uh, what what do you think uh, will happen uh, between America and Iran? And then he said, if America wants to put Iran under uh, on check uh, to control the IOGC behavior. Uh, they can't stay in the JCPOA. They have to quit because, because precisely because of that, because, because by, by staying in the JCPOA, uh, the US relinquish its most powerful leverage, the financial sanctions. Um, people sometimes say, okay, you know, you, you, Iran was uh, able to uh, sell oil to countries like China and other buyers, um, but so that's partially true, but the problem is almost nobody talk about, uh, uh, nobody really, really nobody talks about what really people don't talk about here is that when they sell their oil, how they can get their money back. Um, it's very costly when the financial sanction is in place. It costs, so they had to sell oil at a steeply de uh, discounted price, and then it's not easy for them to get the money back. Um, and then uh, in the end, uh, in order to get this illicit money back, um, it's it's very costly. So that's the cost, you know, that's the the, the efficacy of uh, sanctions, uh, financial sanctions, and people don't talk about it because it's it's kind of you know um, inconvenient thing for people who are uh, uh, for G uh, for JCPOA supporters uh, to address. So even if they can sell oil, it's it's really not that effective. Uh, uh, but, they they can't thrive on that. They they can't they can. It, it's a, it's you know like a small pocket money for them. This is an excellent segue to my next question for you, which is how would you assess President Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA and the reimposition of nuclear sanctions and what he called the maximum pressure campaign? You know, as I said, what was eye opening to me it was well, those things I learned from Iranian prisoners are, are, around me, and then uh, based on. I, what I learned from people like this uh, money launderer, um, I realized that uh, um, the U.S. government knew exactly what's going on. They knew what exactly uh, leverages uh, they had uh, in their hand. So uh, quitting the JCPOA by the time of May 2018 wasn't really a surprise to me. I, I watched uh, the uh, the 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 uh, president's uh, um, statement uh, in the TV. It was broadcasted live uh, on Iranian English uh, TV press TV, 
Um, and then um, um, I thought, based on my already uh, my uh, my existing un uh, understanding of a JCPOA at the time, I thought this is this is exactly the logical step uh, that they are that the U.S. Uh, would take so so yes so so that wasn't really a surprise and then that uh, seemed to make perfect sense um, to me and in retrospect uh, I think it it does make sense still uh, it has accumulated uh, a lot of momentum uh, and leverage um, against Iran um, and uh, uh, so I just read um, some statistics a couple of days ago. So by, by, by the end of 2017, the Iranian foreign reserve, foreign exchange reserve was $120 billion, uh, according to CIA. And according to the IMF uh, in, uh, I think, uh, October, by, uh, according to uh, IMF, uh, a, a, a study. Um, at this time, October October 2020, the Iranian foreign exchange reserve has done, has come down to 8.8 .8 billion dollars. So you can see the steep uh, decline of Iranian foreign policy uh, foreign exchange reserve. So the country is basically on the brink of bankruptcy. So that's the leverage, uh, I, I I would say. Um, and then I, I would think uh, we, we should uh, we should continue to use our leverage uh, in dealing with Iran, right? So um, I think that's 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 very very uh, critical uh, and 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 an, an important piece um, uh, of what we have in our hand, and that we should not uh, lose sight of. So what advice would you offer to the incoming Biden administration as they face an Iran nuclear issue that seems to be escalating as Iran increases enrichment? It seems like it's sort of seeking to provoke a crisis. What advice would you offer to President Biden and his national security team? You raised a very important issue. Uh, so Iran has been provoking and then their nuclear stockpile has been increasing uh, and then now um, they're they're closer to uh, being able to have a bomb, right? Um, and um, but we ignore several issues, or, or, or we neg neglect several issues, uh, uh, to be sure. Um, so uh, one thing is, um, if you were the Iranian regime, if you put yourself in the shoes of the Iranian regime, what would be your options when you face an, an a, a, a overwhelming? Uh, um, uh, political, financial, uh, and military pressure. Uh, maximum pressure really started or, or kicked in in, uh, in the second half of 2019 and early 2020. Um, the pressure is still increasing uh, as, uh, as we're speaking now. So if you are Iran, what are you gonna do? So you are going to think, I think it is fair to say, okay, Trump will have a re-election. Uh, we will wait, we'll wait and see what will happen uh, if he's gonna be voted out of office. Um, and as, as it turned out, he, 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 was, he, uh, he was voted out of office, then it's kind of like a windfall for Iran. But in, the, uh, in due course, your only logical option is to resist. You have no other viable option because if, doing otherwise would be perceived as weak um, and uh, 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 giving in. You cannot afford to do that because that will have a series of uh, uh, internal political consequences, right? So the, and, 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 and bear in mind that Iran is a big country, uh, 80 million people, uh, more than 80 million, and it is a diverse, it has a diverse economy, uh, probably the most diverse, it has the most diverse uh, uh, and the capable economy uh, uh, in the Middle East, um, other than Israel and um, uh, Turkey, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so that's the thing, and the natural thing that they would do. They would resist, and they they actually can resist, and they can resist quite, for quite a long time. So, but at this moment, when we say, and many people do say that, they say, 
uh, the uh, Trump's uh, maximum pressure campaign has failed miserably. And I think that's an overstatement. Um, it's it's uh, uh, more appropriate to say that a maximum, campaign, a maximum pressure campaign has not been um, uh, successful, but it certainly has not been a, uh, a sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's okay. Yeah. No yeah, but but yeah, but but it's it's sorry, it, 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 but but yeah, but it certainly has not been a failure, because it has not been given enough time, because Iran is too big, uh, to wither, the pressure, and we tend not to give them the credit for that, and then we tend tend to play down the effect and uh, 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 and efficacy um, of uh, the Trump administration's uh, uh, approach to Iran. Because, because many progressives simply hate him um, for his other politics, uh, you know, other aspects of politics. So I think sometimes we're, we're, we can be easily blindsided uh, uh, for, uh, for that. So you, I believe if given time, uh, as I outlined to you, Iran is on the brink of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, the maximum campaign pressure, if given, if given time, will produce some results. Uh, and then it will be up to the wisdom of the Biden administration uh, if they take this seriously, if they really understand um, uh, the, the, the need uh, to put Iran under pressure uh, to, uh, so that at some point the United States and the, its regional allies uh, can um, um, negotiate a better, more comprehensive deal with Iran. So what do you think the relationship is between the financial collapse that the U.S. sought to inflict and political collapse in Iran? Uh, okay, so if you aim at a regime change, uh, you probably won't get a regime change, but you'll probably get something lesser. Um, if you can somehow limit uh, the, 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 the menace of the regime uh, that, that, that the regime is doing, and then if you're patient enough um, to, to wait, uh, and I think, I think patience is the problem in the United States because we have electoral cycles, right? Um, so um, if, you, but let's say, assuming we have patience, we have the luxury uh, 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 of waiting, um, then I think uh, what is reasonable uh, or more attainable uh, would be through um, severe pressure, uh, suspended, uh, uh, suspended uh, severe pressure, um, Iran will be forced to negotiate and then they will be forced to make a, a, certain, uh, a, a certain compromise and we'll be able to create a mechanism uh, to put them under control, uh, their behavior. And as time goes, I'm, I'm talking about entirely a ideal, um, ideal scenario. Um, when Khamenei dies, uh, there will be uncertainty, but there is a possibility that uh, the, 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 the regime will become a, a different kind of dictatorship. Let's, uh, let's say um, uh, the IRG, if the IRGC takes over, right? Um, then I think that the, 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 the question really, uh, sometimes people, I, I think there's a, meter, uh, there's a misunderstanding. Uh, for example, some people said, uh, say, uh, you know, next June, I mean, the, the coming June will be the Iranian uh, uh, election. And then uh, it looks very, very likely like um, a senior IRGC uh, officer, uh, former uh, IRGC officer will be elected Iranian president. And then if that is the case, then Iran will be less incentivized to, to negotiate with the United States. Uh, I look at this very, very differently. I think um, it's never a matter of whether to negotiate with the United States, but um, when and how to negotiate with the United States. So, uh, so that is to say, uh, and I see it, uh, I, I still see a possibility in an ideal uh, uh, scenario, again, uh, as I can imagine, uh, that at some point um, the IRGC will come to negotiate um, uh, with the United States as a state actor uh, if they got a presidency. Um, and then there, there might be uh, less internal disagreement 
uh, about uh, the approach uh, uh, to its uh, its external uh, relations. Um, and then if in that case, a, a deal can be reached, uh, hopefully a better deal, then the deal is more sustainable. Then over time, uh, I, I, I think it, it may be possible uh, to turn the Iranian regime into a normal authoritarian regime. Uh, I, I think that's probably um, that's probably a more more realistic uh, deal. Uh, saying we'll just uh, than saying we'll just uh, uh, keep pressing the uh, keep pressuring the regime, the current regime, and eventually it will collapse. Um, I, I see less uh, the situation would unfold that way than the way that. Uh, I, I have just described to you. Can I ask you what you think the three things are that keep Iran's senior officials up at night are and why? Um, well, I think there's, I don't know if I can have a top three, but let's say, let, let, let's try that. Uh, so one thing, uh, uh, how to maintain the regime. Uh, I think that's the, the big important, uh, the biggest uh, thing. Uh, and then uh, they have to make, make sure that the regime does not implode, right? So the biggest threat of the regime, and they know it, is from within. Uh, within means within its own rank, uh, not, not from, I, I do not mean within Iran, right? They, uh, apparently, they have no qualms to, to shoot people, to kill. But I think a, a legitimate concern would be internal you know, uh, defection. Um, Giving uh, elites giving up, uh, stop supporting the system. So they need to prevent that. And I think so far they're doing a really good job. Uh, and my my analysis of that is, it's a it's a highly ideological ideological regime, um, uh, but they're very pragmatic in terms of uh, uh, realizing uh, uh, attaining short term goals. Um, so means just uh, so, so the end justifies the means. And then the level of a cynicism, I believe, is saving them. Because if, if, if you look at, if you look at uh, the, um, the, the experience of, uh, of a Soviet Union, uh, then the, the whole empire was really brought down uh, by a true believer uh, who believed that the system can be reformed and should be reformed. And he sincerely carried out the reform and then uh, unintentionally took the, Union apart, right? Uh, in a in a nutshell. So Iran knew that, and then I think they have a much higher degree of cynicism, uh, which is probably saving them, uh, allowing them to be more resilient. Um, and then the next thing is how to deal with, uh, you know. Then I, I think that's a paramount thing, uh, the maintenance of the regime. But then. The next thing would be, how do you deal with uh, uh, possible internal pressure and external pressure? Uh, internal pressure, because, because if people go onto the street all the time, it's costly to oppress. Uh, there is a political cost, uh, there is a financial cost, right? Um, and there's a human cost, of course. Um, and then, and then uh, uh, internationally, um, you know, the, uh, Abraham Accord that is happening today. Uh, people often people say, uh, especially if you if you look at progressive media and social media, there are a lot of uh, discussion on this, and they say, well, basically uh, Trump bribed these countries. And it's exchange of interest. Um, but but tell me, what kind of uh, interstate relation is not exchange of interest, right? And then the, the, the very fact of this and the very kernel of this is that, and then the people tend not to admit, um, is that the Iranian menace is pushing away um, potential uh, allies or uh, potential friends um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and making the enemies unite, right? That's the process that we're, we're, we're seeing today exactly. So, um, and then this is the failure on the Iranian part. Um, and then the, the uh, people who are 
uh, busy uh, arguing we should return right away to JCPOA uh, is, you know, if we can see, see it from a uh, different aspect, what they're doing is making the already failing Iranian foreign policy a more, you know, less a failure, a more a success. And then that's uh, not wise, uh, not a wise thing to do, right? Okay. Yeah, so, and then these are the three, three, three things that I can think of that they, they have to constantly grapple with. Okay, thank you Wang Shui for what has been a very interesting conversation. This has been really terrific and very informative. I hope that next time you'll be able to join us here in person at the INSS, thank you. Yes, I would love, I would love that. I have so many friends who have been to Israel and then they really, they really enjoy it there. Uh, so uh, one day, uh, and I will make sure, uh, I will actually get the Israeli visa on my passport, uh, okay. not on a piece of paper.